Support for Carolina Business Review provided by Grant Thornton, an international accounting, tax, and business advisory organization dedicated to serving middle market companies. Grant Thornton, a passion for the business of accounting. Novant Health is a not-for-profit group of hospitals and medical clinics caring for surrounding communities. Their nurses, physicians, and staff are nationally recognized for their remarkable devotion to patient care. And by Sonoco, a global manufacturer of consumer and industrial packaging products and provider of packaging services with more than 300 operations in 35 countries. Carolinas are on a bit of a tear, and just when they need the boost, within the last two weeks, Bloomberg Business Week is named Raleigh as the best place to live in the country. Development Counselors International named South Carolina and North Carolina of the best business climates in the U.S. as well. The question is, how do we convert much of this national recognition and plain old goodwill into tangible growth? Welcome back to the most widely watched source for Carolina business and public policy. There is more dialogue about the importance of coordinated economic development and infrastructure strategies. Bridgestone Tire clearly sees something with a $1.2 billion investment in Aiken. And the global guru and economic clustering expert Michael Porter was back in South Carolina's capital city recently celebrating New Carolina's 7th anniversary. We begin in just a moment and later on Low Country company and vapor apparel boss, Chris Bernay. Major funding also by the Duke Endowment, a private foundation in Charlotte, enriching communities in the Carolinas through higher education, health care, rural churches, and children's services. And by Blue Cross and Blue Shield of North Carolina, who's responsible for rising health care costs. Join Blue Cross and Blue Shield of North Carolina and many others in a candid discussion at letstalkcost.com. This edition of Carolina Business Review was recorded September 23rd, 2011. On this week's program, Donnie Hicks of the Gaston County Economic Development Commission, Jack Roach of the Southeastern Institute of Manufacturing Technology, and special guest Chris Burnett, co-founder and chief revenue officer of Vapor Apparel. Now, Chris William. Hello, welcome to our program. Uh, Donnie, welcome back to the program. And Jack, nice to meet you. Good to have you here. Thanks. Glad to be here. Uh, Donnie, we're going to start with you. You know, we get... We, North Carolina and South Carolina have all these amazing demographics. And, you know, people have been on the you know, numerous programs that we've had about how the demographics have bailed us out of having even a worst recessionary feel. Uh, and we get, you know, Raleigh was named as the best place, best city in the U.S. for many reasons by uh, Business Week recently. This other uh, study, uh, uh, economic development groups always say that the Carolinas are among the best states to do business in a business climate. You know, are those just feel-good, nice promotional things to have, or is there a way to convert that? I think they're fairly meaningful. If you look at a lot of the surveys, they're done of either corporate real estate executives, site location consultants, or CEOs. So obviously North Carolina and South Carolina have a lot of top of mind with those individuals, and they also must believe that our policies and our development opportunities are, are better than other locations. I think the challenge for us is to go out and take that uh, door that's been open for us mm -hmm. and go out and market our region and two states to, uh, to those people. Jack, you are nodding along there. Is mm -hmm. that something you agree with or do you see or do you have personal experience with? Uh, we agree that the states of North and South Carolina are really good states for businesses to do business in. Uh, the workforce is there. The support mechanisms are there. The technical colleges and community colleges are there to train people. And all of that leads toward manufacturers being satisfied with a workforce and a place to do business. You know, and, and let's stay with you for a second, Jack, because S SIMT is, is really a, a, it's a very unique organization connected to Florence Darlington Tech. You know, and, and a lot of these technical systems in South Carolina and the technical system in, in North Carolina will talk about, with good evidence, but will talk about workforce development. But this is, but, but your group is really the first bricks and mortar on the ground, serious development that is connected to the technical system but is actually doing training, workforce development outside of the college and not doing it necessarily for students, but really is a vendor to, to, to business. Is that right? That's right, yeah. Is, it, is that unique or am I just thinking that's unique? Well, the, uh, the training portion of it is not so much unique as much as the facility and the other technical assets we have there. Uh, many technical colleges, in fact, most do workforce training for client companies. 
But what we have at Florence Darlington Tech and at SIMT is a, is a new facility, a very large facility, with a lot of technical expertise and other areas besides just the training. So if a company needs support for workforce development, we can train workers in a lot of different skill sets, but we also can do some other things like prototyping of component parts and simulations and, and virtual reality presentations where a company can actually come in and work with us to develop new products and manufacturing processes. You, you know, Donnie, I don't want to put you on the spot here about knowing what they do or not, but that would seem like, you know, we have a lot of dialogues in, in different communities about how, how, to, how to cooperate among economic development groups and how to cooperate when it comes to, to long-term planning. And a group like SIMT would seem like that, that's, a, that's a pretty good deal. That's a critical asset. Uh, the governor released a report about two weeks ago, and it talked about the middle skills gap that we have in uh, North Carolina. And since middle skills meaning middle what? Skills. what? Technical skills would require typically a two-year degree. Uh, and if you look at the number of people being trained in those things, welding, machining, certain types of maintenance applications, there's a long list of those, typically trained in the community college system. If you look at the, man, the employer needs for those people and the m number of people we're training, there's a huge mismatch. Mm -hmm. So if there's one area that we can create jobs in faster maybe than other locations at an, at, through an easier pace, and I haven't gone to a four-year school, um, something like what they're doing there is, is absolutely critical. Is, is North Carolina tooled and ready for that, that, that demographic? I actually believe we are. I think we have most of the training that we need already in the community college system. I think where we have the gap is the knowledge from the school guidance counselors at the high school level and bridging that gap between the high schools and the community colleges to let these kids know that if you go and do these things, there's a good job opportunity for you out there. I think the gap is just in knowledge, not in physical assets at the colleges. Jack? Well, it's true. I agree with what uh, Donnie has said. The, the, the gap is between the, the employees that are ready to go into a highly skilled technical job and the training that's required to get them there the people that have been working traditionally in manufacturing have been lower skilled jobs in many cases and today those aren't the jobs that are out there. The jobs that are out there are high skilled, high tech jobs. People have to go back and get retrained and reskilled to fill those needs. You know, when we were talking before the program, Jack, one of the, one of the, um, one of the populations of, of unemployed and those looking for good workers is construction, ironically enough. and, and, and the, the Carolinas Association of General Contractors said one of the reasons that, that builders in construction can't find good workers because, because of the evisceration of that industry in 2008 and 2009, and those people have just left the industry in general. So I guess the question is, is that, how, how, how do you come down on that issue? Is that what's happening in the labor market? Is it's been so um, emptied out that now folks are, have completely left industries and are retraining into other industries? Well... You know, there's a big misconception that there's a, that manufacturing is dead in this country, and it's not true. It's just that the lower skilled jobs are gone. Today's manufacturing companies in particular are looking for employees, but they're looking for high skilled employees. Mm -hmm. And that's where the training comes in that we provide, as well as other uh, technical colleges around the system. But the construction industry has a huge gap in, in welding technology, particularly in construction of metal, you know, steel buildings, uh, we're involved heavily in, in training welding mm -hmm. students today, particularly for the power industry and right. the construction of new power plants. Uh, Donnie, let's, last couple minutes here, let me, let me bring you on, up on a public policy piece, and that is the, the National Labor Relations Board. Uh, uh, month old, months old suit on, on Boeing now, and now the, the, the state of South Carolina's uh, Chamber of Commerce, Otis Rawl, who's been on this program uh, uh, among other people, they are challenging the NLRB's new rule requiring businesses to post notices explaining empl employees' rights uh, to labor. Uh, the South Carolina Ch Chamber of Commerce says that they have overreached and they shouldn't be allowed to do that. And that's punitive on business and it's, it's opened up a whole bunch of questions. Uh, how do you come down on that issue and what has North Carolina done in response to the NLRB in South Carolina? I think this is a pretty serious issue. A couple years ago, the conversation focused on the Employee Free Choice Act. There was a great deal of concern from the business community. The Obama administration was going to push through a free choice act that would allow companies to become unionized through a card check process versus a, a ballot. You would not have an election. You wouldn't have a secret vote. You just sign a card saying, I want to be a member. And if you get a majority of the people that signed that card, you're de facto unionized. So there's a lot of effort around that. Then I think the administration realized that they couldn't do that. And I think you've seen the uh, NLRB take a real activist role in pushing through some administrative rule changes that gives the union some advantages that they expected from the Free Choice Act. 
North Carolina, I think it's House Bill 800, was uh, working its way through the system. And basically it said that they wanted to have a constitutional amendment that would allow you to have, um, to vote, to say that all North Carolina citizens would have a right to a secret ballot election if there was an attempt to be unionized. Um, so I think that reaffirms our right to work state, but it wasn't really an anti-union movement. I think it was a, a pure choice on the part of the legislature to say you should have the secret ballot process. And now with the uh, NLRB rule changes, mm -hmm. you're gonna be required to post something saying you can be represented by a union organization and be required to post that. And, and I think most of the business community feels like that that's overreaching by the NLRB. It, and it, in fact, the Chamber of Commerce in South Carolina says that it, it, it's, it, they don't have the authority and mm -hmm. that's a coercion of employees to make them feel uh, some type of uh, pressure to do that. Yeah. And so I think the business community is paying a lot of attention to this. Uh, there was some relaxation when I think everybody realized the Free Choice Act wouldn't be approved, and then it was done administratively. So I think the, the effort is now back on to uh, try to pull some of those rules back. Yeah, and, and in just the last 30 seconds or so, Donnie, is this, is this because it's happening in our front yard that we notice it, or is this some type of escalation and maybe some final conflict between labor and business? I think we're more aware of it just because it is in our backyard. But I think uh, if you go through the economic development community throughout the U.S., people are concerned that if a company will not have the ability to move their production facilities or expand them, Boeing didn't take jobs in the Northwest and bring them to Charleston. This is an expansion of their facility, and they should have the right to decide where their capacity goes. And I think that's uh, disturbing to a lot of people. I think it sends a bad message, especially to foreign investors who may be wanting to come to the U.S. and feel like that they may not have the freedom to do what they want to with their facilities. Uh, that'll be the last word, at least for the first part. Uh, gentlemen, stay with us. Uh, next week on this program, he is the North Carolina Lieutenant Governor. Walter Dalton will be back here, and he's talking about a logistics plan that's a statewide logistics plan that's been in the works now for two or three years here in North Carolina about how to coordinate and better ha have better coordinated efforts around logistics and infrastructure in the old North State. And then in two weeks, it's all about energy, as it has been for a while now. On the program, Wayne Wilkins, Bill Mahoney, uh, John Enslin, as well as Jeff Merrifield will be back on this program as well. You know, the question is, why should Boeing get all the good press and, and some bad press in some case? For the last few years, and according to the Charleston Regional Business Journal, Vapor Apparel has been named as one of the low country's fastest growing and best performing companies. That is no small achievement giving the state of uncertainty right now. Question is, how do they continue to post top line growth how do they continue to look so good? And especially given offshore manufacturing, how do they remain competitive through an unfinished free trade agreement? Joining us now is Vapor Apparel co-founder uh, Chris Bernay. Uh, Chris, uh, welcome from Charleston. And Thank you. Thanks for making the trip. Absolutely. Uh, let's talk about this. And You know, let's start with this perception, Chris. Here you are, small company, explosive growth in one of the hottest markets in the, in the country and got a lot of momentum. There's no doubt about it. Chris, from your point of view, what do you see is this uh, is the disconnect between what you see in business and what's widely reported and talked about? Wow. Um, well, I think I just go back to how how we started the company. Um, I mean, we got lucky in that we 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 found a problem. When you when you find a problem for people that need solving. What was the problem? What was the problem? Well, we we were both my partner uh, Jackson Burnett and I. We we were both in the uh, digital print technology field. And we saw that nobody was making performance apparel uh, or clothing that was engineered for the rigors of the process. It's, it's a difficult process. It requires 380 degrees of heat right onto the garment. So we engineered our garments to not only perform well on the field, but also in the manufacturing process. And, and that's a niche. And when you can solve a problem in a niche, you can create profit. And what, you know, from your point of view, you talk to a lot of other companies in that kind of that, that very steep part of the J-curve in growth. When you hear about some of the broader economic issues that are going on and you talk to some of your colleagues, is there a disconnect? Are we talking about the right things or are we focused on some things that maybe we shouldn't be so focused on? Well, first of all, I, I travel a lot and um, I'm a recovering English major, so I'm fascinated by business statistics. I'm, <laughs> I've, I'm like an amateur economist when I travel. I ask everybody, hey, how's business? Um, it's a great way to ask the get get the conversation started, and it, it's difficult out there right now. Um, I think you know we try to simplify things. We 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 focus on blocking and tackling. We we focus on making money every month as opposed to waiting for it to show up on a windfall in the fourth quarter. 
Um, so by, by focusing on a good product, a good experience, we're in a market that doesn't really have good reputation for customer service. So we try to over deliver on customer service and add value. Um, you know, I think sometimes members of the team get tired of, are we adding enough value here? Right. Um, so we focus on doing that. And, and, and the other thing is we're really not a clothing company. We happen to make clothes, but we're really a, a company that's leveraging mass customization, which is a massive trend in America and throughout the world today. It has enormous ramifications to a business in a tough business climate. Um, you don't have to forecast how much of that design you're going to sell. I can print them at, in literally increments of a dozen. So it's a very cash flow friendly uh, experience to be a, a customer of Vapor Apparel. Donnie? It'd be interesting seeing uh, your supply chain. I know you have some facilities in Columbia that supply you and how the federal trade initiatives either help or, imp or hurt what you're trying to do. We have some people that are heavily dependent on CAFTA and Gaston County. I'd be interested to see yeah. what, how that translate to your business. Well, then and you're explain what CAFT is, by Sure. Okay. It'd be a Caribbean Basin Initiative where you could have yarn manufactured in the U.S. sent to the Caribbean to produce the garment, bring it back into the U.S., and that allows us to essentially compete with China. Right. The theory of it is, is we can create shorter lead times and create something in, in our hemisphere that needs the apparel needs of the market. I, I mean, we're, we're a poster child for this issue. Um, you know, we've, we've gone from two guys working out of their homes to 25 employees, uh, 15 of those employees in the last two years. And uh, frankly, with the change that happened with APDEA in February, the Andean Trade Preference Drug Eradication Act, um, which has been in existence for 20 years and seven years on apparel, um, you know, by and large, it's a good decision to move the way your government is, is forecasting you to move. So we saw uh, the buildup for the free trade agreement. We said, okay, our government's telling us to go here. Columbia is a strategic ally in the region. Um, and you're talking about yarn forward yeah. with, with, with CAFTA. Um, what, what, what we've done is we, we picked Columbia for some very specific reasons, one of which is that they are here and that they are strategic. Um, they have an unbelievable environmental record. Uh, I'm constantly amazed at how few people know that it's the 10th greenest country on the planet, that almost 70% of its country's natural power, national power grid is renewable energy. I mean, think if we could say half of that. Mm -hmm. So that's, we, we want to be green, and, and we want to be green in a lot of ways. We have a LEED certified facility. Our inks are water-based. Um, so back to the Asia question, you know, my partner was in Bogota this week with um, one of our largest customers um, is New Balance. New Balance loves the products we've made for our own brand and they want to leverage the same for theirs. Um, and the free trade agreement is the elephant in the room. Um, we've been- So it's punitive? Well, what happened is we were duty free until February. The reason I don't have those 10 additional employees right now on our team is because we've paid almost a half a million dollars in duty to the federal government since February. Now, we're a good company, we're, we're a good size, but we're less than $10 million. I'd like to see other companies ingest that kind of profit handover. Um, we're growing. We grew, we're, we're scheduled to grow more than 25% this year. All of that growth is going to pay for that duty instead of going into new jobs. And, and these aren't sweatshop jobs. You these know, are jobs that these are Charleston me, Jack, jobs. I just want to okay. chase this one down. So these are these are jobs that would be in Charleston, domestic. They'd be side. specifically located how, in North Charleston. How how, how do South how, how do South Carolina lawmakers take that? It's um it's always interesting when you're watching C-SPAN to see what's going to happen in your business. Like I was yesterday watching the GSPTAA bill uh, bill go through the Senate. Um, there's a lot of polarization right now out there, Chris, mm -hmm. and and. Um, you know, the Tea Party is, a, is an impact on this process. Um, we've been in touch with our member of Congress. He is intimately aware of the ramifications on our Tim business. Scott, Tim Scott. Yes, sir. Um, we're optimistic that he'll vote mm -hmm. our way. Uh, that the next step on the, on the ride to free trade is the House has to vote on the GSP TAA. And TAA is, uh, is trade adjustment assistance, which goes to retraining of American workers who may have lost their job because of foreign competition. It has to pass in order for the free trade to pass, regardless of why uh, you would be against it. It's a necessary element to get to free trade with these other three countries. And, and it is not something that a lot of people on the conservative side 
of the of 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 the world want. It, it, four of which are, are in South Car our South Carolina representatives. And we've spoken to members of their staff, and and we've articulated our position. You know, what was great is last week I, uh, I I I spoke with the head of the South Carolina Farm Bureau. You know, he's got the same issues I do. Uh, the, the United States had 87 percent of Colombia's corn market. Less than four years ago, it's now down to 27%. One of the big reasons I believe the free trade agreement will go through is because of the Colombian-Canadian free trade agreement, which I'm sure you've watched. You know, now American agricultural companies have a 7.5% disadvantage to Canada going into Colombia, and, and that's not going to be tolerated. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Chris, I'm more of a technology kind of guy, yeah. and I know your company has been pretty innovative in what you've developed. And I also saw where you won several awards last year at the SGIA Expo. Oh, yeah, sure. And I was curious what those awards were about. Um, well, one of them was great. I mean, um, we were, we're the first company in South Carolina to win the Golden Image Award. Um, 463 entries from 63 countries, and one award was given to us. And um, what's unique about our technology is, is we've invented uh, clothing that feels like cotton but performs like performance apparel that's engineered specifically for the print technologies that are growing fast. And we've tried to envelop our shirts with technology. I'm a recovering data guy myself. I, I used to work for Knology. I, I, I helped start one of the first ISPs in South Carolina. Um, so when I started selling ink, I was like, wow, where'd my career go wrong? Um, but then I realized that that ink was a tactical output of the digital age. Um, Facebook and Photoshop and the internet drive content creation. Mm -hmm. And when you're in the business of mass customization, that's great. Um, you know, mass customization impacts the way people view themselves. And, and, and we're a big fan of, of narrow casting content. Uh, we have no setup charges. Everything's digital. There's no plates to make. Um, our reaction time can be incredible. Uh, so the, the concept of customizing every garment for us, that's the order we want. Um, a great example of a client for us is the Boy Scouts of America. We're making 40,000 garments a year for them. If you've ever heard of Philmont, it's like, you know, the mecca of Boy Scouts. My son's in the Cub Scouts now. Um, we make 40,000 some odd garments for them a year. The average order is nine shirts because we have troop level specific printing on each garment. That's the kind of business China cannot take away. Um, I have a theory that if they ever get one of those tubes that the bank uses to get the money in from the third row when you're in the drive-thru, we might be in a little trouble. Um, but even then, I think we could, we could beat them to market with quality and customer service. You, you know, one, one of the things that you, you talked about mass customization, but I want to get back to this whole idea that, that most, of your, most of your manufacturing and, and most of your employees are offshore. Do, in, you, do yeah. you take heat? You might not be in China, but you're down in Colombia, South America. Mm -hmm. How, how, what kind of heat do you take and how do you, how do you rationalize that? Well, um, you know, I was on this, this panel recently in, in, uh, in, in Charleston and, and the same question came up and I said, you know, there was about 230, 240 years ago, these people called the British and they got really mad at these people called the colonists because they were stealing all their manufacturing jobs. Um, and then there was these people called northerners who got mad at these people called southerners because they were stealing all their manufacturing jobs. Um, you talked about the low level manufacturing following the cost of labor. We're talking about th a thousand year trend there. Um, what are we doing? We're instead of a whole bunch of jobs being in Asia, they're now, we're moving them back. And New Balance is a great example of this. You know, they're, they're in Asia, they're moving back over to this hemisphere with us. Um, yes, they're gonna create jobs in Colombia, but they're gonna cause some high quality jobs to occur here in the states as well, um, and and that's through that massive uh, mass customization, that rapidity, that instant replenishment model that we've created. I've built apparel jobs in this in this state, and nobody else talks about themselves doing that. So, granted, it's not thousands. That that that'll be the last word, and that's a good place to end. Chris, thanks for being on the program. Thank you, uh, Jack. Welcome. Good to have you here. Come Thank back, you. Donnie. Always nice to Thank see you. you. Until next week, I'm Chris William. We hope your business is good. Good night. Major funding for Carolina Business Review was provided by...
the Duke Endowment, a private foundation in Charlotte, enriching communities in the Carolinas through higher education, health care, rural churches, and children's services. And by Blue Cross and Blue Shield of North Carolina, who's responsible for rising health care costs. Join Blue Cross and Blue Shield of North Carolina and many others in a candid discussion at letstalkcost.com. Grant Thornton, an international accounting, tax, and business advisory organization dedicated to serving middle market companies. Grant Thornton, a passion for the business of accounting. Novant Health is a not-for-profit group of hospitals and medical clinics caring for surrounding communities. Their nurses, physicians, and staff are nationally recognized for their remarkable devotion to patient care. And by Sonoco, a global manufacturer of consumer and industrial packaging products and provider of packaging services with more than 300 operations in 35 countries. And by viewers like you. Thank you. Promotional consideration provided by Business North Carolina Magazine. For more information, visit carolinabusinessreview.com.